A storm was coming, but the winds were still. And in the wild woods of Brusseliand, before an oak so hollow, huge and old, it looked a tower of ivied mason work. At Merlin's feet the wily Vivian lay. For he that always bare in bitter grudge the slights of Arthur and his table, Mark, the Cornish king, had heard a wandering voice, a minstrel of Carlean, by strong storm blown into shelter at Tintagel, say that out of naked night-like purity, Sir Lancelot worshipped no unmarried girl, but the great queen herself, fought in her name, swear by her, Vows like theirs, that I in heaven love most, but neither marry nor are given in marriage, angels of our Lord's report. He ceased, and then, for Vivian sweetly said, she sat beside the banquet nearest Mark, and is the fair example followed, sir, in Arthur's household? Answered innocently, I by some few. I truly, youths that hold it more beseems the perfect virgin knight to worship woman as true wife beyond all hope of gaining than as maiden girl. They place their pride in Lancelot and the Queen, so passionate for an utter purity beyond the limit of their bond are these, for Arthur bound them not to singleness, brave hearts and clean, and yet God guide them young. Then Mark was half in heart to hurl his cup straight at the speaker, but forbore. He rose to leave the hall, and Vivian following him turned to her. Here are snakes within the grass, and you may think so, Vivian, save ye fear the monkish manhood and the mask of pure worn by this court, can stir them till they sting. And Vivian answered, smiling scornfully, Why fear? Because that fostered at thy court I savour of thy virtue, fear them. No, as love, if love is perfect, casts out fear, so hate, if hate is perfect, casts out fear. My father died in battle against the king, my mother on his corpse in open field. She bore me there, for born from death was I among the dead and sown upon the wind, and then on thee, and shown the truth betimes, that old true filth and bottom of the well where truth is hidden. Gracious lessons thine and maxims of the mud, this Arthur pure, Great nature through the flesh herself hath made gives him the lie. There is no being pure, my cherub, saith not holy writ the same. If I were Arthur, I would have thy blood, thy blessing, stainless king. I bring thee back, when I have ferreted out their burrowings, the hearts of all this order in mine hand. Ay, so that fate and craft and folly close, perchance, one curl of Arthur's golden beard. To me this narrow, grizzled fork of thine is cleaner fashioned. Well, I loved thee first. That warps the wit. Loud laughed the graceless mark, but Vivian into Camelot stealing lodged low in the city, and on a festal day when Guinevere was crossing the great hall, cast herself down, knelt to the queen and wailed. Why kneel ye there? What evil have ye wrought? Rise! And the damsel bidden rise arose and stood with folded hands and downward eyes of glancing corner, and old meekly said, None wrought, but suffered much, an orphan maid. My father died in battle for thy king, my mother on his corpse, in open field, the sad sea-sounding wastes of Lyonesse. O oh, wretch, no friend, and now by Mark the king, for that small charm of feature mine pursued, if any such be mine. I fly to thee, 
save, save me, thou, woman of women, thine the wreath of beauty, thine the crown of power, be thine the balm of pity, O heaven's own white earth angel, stainless bride of stainless king, help, for he follows, take me to thyself, O yield me shelter for mine innocency among thy maidens. Here her slow sweet eyes, fear tremulous, but humbly hopeful, rose fixed on her hearers, while the queen who stood all glittering like May sunshine on May leaves in green and gold, and plumed with green, replied, Peace, child, of over-praise and over-blame we choose the last. Our noble Arthur, him ye scarce can overpraise, will hear and know. Nay, we believe all evil of thy mark. Well, we shall test thee farther. But this hour we ride a-hawking with Sir Lancelot. He hath given us a fair falcon which he trained. We go to prove it. Bide ye here the while. She passed, and Vivian murmured after, Go. I bide the while. Then through the portal arch, peering askance, and muttering broken wise, as one that labours with an evil dream, beheld the queen and Lancelot get to horse. Is that the Lancelot, goodly I but gaunt, courteous amends for gauntness, takes her hand? That glance of theirs, but for the street had been a clinging kiss. How hand lingers in hand. Let go at last. They ride away. To hawk for waterfowl. Royaler game is mine. For such a supersensual, sensual bond As that grey cricket chirped of at a hearth. Touch flax with flame. A glance will serve. The liars. Ah, little rat, that borest in the dyke thy hole by night, to let the boundless deep down upon far-off cities while they dance, or dream of thee they dreamt not, nor of me. These, I but each of either, ride and dream the mortal dream that never yet was mine. Ride, ride and dream until ye wake to me. Then, narrow court and lubber king, farewell, for Lancelot will be gracious to the rat, and our wise queen, if knowing that I know, will hate, loathe, fear, but honour me the more. Yet while they rode together down the plain, their talk was all of training, terms of art, diet and sealing, Jess's leash and lure. She's too noble, he said, to check at pies, nor will she rake. There is no baseness in her. Here, when the queen demanded us by chance, know ye the stranger woman? Let her be, said Lancelot, and unhooded cast off the goodly falcon free. She towered. Her bells, tone under tone, shrilled, and they lifted up their eager faces, wondering at the strength, boldness, and royal knighthood of the bird who pounced her quarry and slew it. Many a time, as once of old among the flowers they rode, but Vivian, half forgotten of the queen among her damsels broidering, sat, heard, watched, and whispered. Through the peaceful court she crept and whispered. Then, as Arthur in the highest leavened the world, so Vivian in the lowest, arriving at a time of golden rest, and sowing one ill hint from ear to ear, while all the heathen lay at Arthur's feet, and no quest came, but all was joust and play, leavened his hall. They heard and let her be. Thereafter, as an enemy that has left death in the living waters and withdrawn, the wily Vivian stole from Arthur's court. She hated all the knights, and heard in thought their lavish comment when her name was named. 
For once when Arthur, walking all alone, vexed at a rumour issued from herself of some corruption crept among his knights and met her, Vivian, being greeted fair, would fain have wrought upon his cloudy mood with reverend eyes, mock loyal, shaken voice, and fluttered adoration, and at last, with dark sweet hints of some who prized him more than who should prize him most, at which the king had gazed upon her blankly and gone by. But one had watched and had not held his peace. It made the laughter of an afternoon that Vivian should attempt the blameless king. And after that she set herself to gain him, the most famous man of all those times, Merlin, who knew the range of all their arts, had built the king his haven, ships and halls, was also barred and knew the starry heavens. The people called him Wizard, whom at first she played about with slight and sprightly talk, and vivid smiles, and faintly venomed points of slander, glancing here and grazing there. And yielding to his kindlier moods, the seer would watch her at her petulance, and play, even when they seemed unlovable, and laugh as those that watch a kitten. Thus he grew tolerant of what he half disdained, and she, perceiving that she was but half disdained, began to break her sports with graver fits, turned red or pale, would often, when they met, sigh fully, or all silent gaze upon him with such a fixed devotion that the old man, though doubtful, felt the flattery and at times would flatter his own wish in age for love, and half believe her true. For thus at times he wavered, but that other clung to him, fixed in her will, and so the seasons went. Then fell on Merlin a great melancholy. He walked with dreams and darkness, and he found a doom that ever poised itself to fall, an ever moaning battle in the mist, world war of dying flesh against the life, death in all life and lying in all love, the meanest having power upon the highest, and the high purpose broken by the worm. So, leaving Arthur's court, he gained the beach, there found a little boat and stepped into it, and Vivian followed, but he marked her not. She took the helm and he the sail. The boat drave with a sudden wind across the deeps, and touching Breton sands they disembarked, and then she followed Merlin all the way even to the wild woods of Broceliand, for Merlin once had told her of a charm, the which if any wrought on any one with woven paces and with waving arms, the man so wrought on ever seemed to lie closed in the four walls of a hollow tower, from which was no escape for evermore. And none could find that man for evermore, nor could he see but him who wrought the charm, coming and going, and he lay as dead and lost to life and use and name and fame, and Vivian ever sought to work the charm upon the great enchanter of the time, and fancying that her glory would be great according to his greatness whom she quenched. There lay she all her length and kissed his feet, as if in deepest reverence and in love. A twist of gold was round her hair, a robe of samite without price, that more expressed than hid her, clung about her lissom limbs, in colour like the satin shining palm on sallows in the windy gleams of March, and while she kissed them, crying, Trample me, dear feet, that I have followed through the world, and I will pay you worship. Tread me down, and I will kiss you for it. He was mute. So dark a forethought rolled about his brain, as on a dull day in an ocean cave the blind wave feeling round his long sea-hall in silence. 
Wherefore, when she lifted up a face of sad appeal, and spake, and said, O oh Merlin, do ye love me? And again, O oh Merlin, do ye love me? And once more, Great Master, do ye love me? He was mute. And Lissom Vivian, holding by his heel, writhed towards him, sidled up his knee, and sat. Behind his ankle twined her hollow feet together, curved an arm about his neck, clung like a snake, and letting her left hand droop from his mighty shoulder as a leaf, made with her right a comb of pearl to part the lists of such a board as youth gone out had left in ashes. Then he spoke and said, not looking at her, Who are wise in love, love most, say least. And Vivian answered quick, I saw the little elf god Eilus once in Arthur's arras hall at Camelot. But neither eyes nor tongue, O oh, stupid child, yet you are wise who say it. Let me think silence is wisdom. I am silent then, and ask no kiss. Then adding all at once, And lo, I clothed myself with wisdom, Drew the vast and shaggy mantle of his beard Across her neck and bosom to her knee, And called herself a gilded summer fly, Caught in a great old tyrant spider's web, Who meant to eat her up in that wild wood Without one word. So Vivian called herself, but rather seemed a lovely, baleful star veiled in grey vapour, till he sadly smiled. To what request for what strange boon, he said, are these your pretty tricks and fooleries, O Vivian the preamble? It my thanks, for these have broken up my melancholy. And Vivian answered, smiling saucily, What, O my master, have ye found your voice? I bid the stranger welcome, thanks at last. But yesterday you never opened lip except indeed to drink. No cup had we. In mine own lady palms I culled the spring that gathered trickling dropwise from the cleft, and made a pretty cup of both my hands, and offered you it kneeling. Then you drank and knew no more nor gave me one poor word. Oh, no more thanks than might a goat have given with no more sign of reverence than a beard. And when we halted at that other well, and I was faint to swooning, and you lay foot gilt with all the blossom dust of those deep meadows we had traversed, did you know that Vivian bathed your feet before her own? And yet no thanks, and all through this wild wood and all this morning when I fondled you. Boon! Ay, there was a boon, one not so strange. How had I wronged you? Surely ye are wise, but such a silence is more wise than kind. And Merlin locked his hand in hers and said, Oh, did ye never lie upon the shore, and watch the curled white of the coming wave glassed in the slippery sand before it breaks? Even such a wave, but not so pleasurable, dark in the glass of some presageful mood, had I for three days seen, ready to fall. And then I rose and fled from Arthur's court to break the mood. You followed me unasked, and when I looked and saw you following me still, my mind involved yourself the nearest thing in that mind mist. For shall I tell you truth? You seemed that wave about to break upon me, and sweep me from my hold upon the world, my use and name and fame. Your pardon, child, your pretty sports have brightened all again. And ask your boon, for boon I owe you thrice, Once for wrong done you by confusion, Next for thanks it seems till now neglected, Last for these your dainty gambols. Wherefore ask, and take this boon so strange and not so strange, 
And Viviana answered, smiling mournfully, Oh, not so strange as my long asking it. Not yet so strange as you yourself are strange, nor half so strange as that dark mood of yours. I ever feared ye were not wholly mine, and see, yourself have owned ye did me wrong. The people call you prophet, let it be, but not of those that can expound themselves. Take Vivian for expounder. She will call that three days long presageful gloom of yours no presage, but the same mistrustful mood that makes you seem less noble than yourself. Whenever I have asked this very boon, now asked again. For see you not, dear love, that such a mood as that, which lately gloomed your fancy when ye saw me following you, must make me fear still more you are not mine must make me yearn still more to prove you mine, and make me wish still more to learn this charm of woven paces and of waving hands as proof of trust. O oh, Merlin, teach it me. The charm so taught will charm us both to rest, for grant me some slight power upon your fate, I, feeling that you felt me worthy trust, should rest and let you rest, knowing you mine, and therefore be as great as ye are named, not muffled round with selfish reticence. How hard you look, and how denyingly! Oh, if you think this wickedness in me, that I should prove it on you unawares, that makes me passing wrathful, then our bond had best be loosed for ever. But think or not, by heaven that hears, I tell you the clean truth, as clean as blood of babes, as white as milk. O oh Merlin, may this earth, if ever I, if these unwitty wandering wits of mine, even in the jumbled rubbish of a dream, have tripped on such conjectural treachery, may this hard earth cleave to the nadir hell, down, down, and close again, and nip me flat, if I be such a traitress. Yield my boon, till which I scarce can yield you all I am, and grant my re-reiterated wish, the great proof of your love, because I think, however wise, ye hardly know me yet. And Merlin loosed his hand from hers and said, I never was less wise, however wise. Too curious, Vivian, though you talk of trust. And when I told you first of such a charm, yea, if ye talk of trust, I tell you this, too much I trusted when I told you that, and stirred this vice in you which ruined man through woman the first hour. For howsoever in children a great curiousness be well, who have to learn themselves and all the world, in you that are no child, but still I find your face is practised when I spell the lines, I call it, well, I will not call it vice, but since you name yourself the summer fly, I well could wish a cobweb for the gnat that settles, beaten back, and beaten back settles, till one could yield for weariness. But since I will not yield to give you power upon my life and use and name and fame, why will ye never ask some other boon? Yea, by God's rood, I trusted you too much. And Vivian, like the tenderest-hearted maid that ever bided a tryst at village style, made answer, either eyelid wet with tears. Nay, master, be not wrathful with your maid. Caress her. Let her feel herself forgiven who feels no heart to ask another boon. I think ye know the tender rhyme of trust me not at all or all in all. I heard the great Sir Lancelot sing it once, and it shall answer for me. Listen to it. In love, if love be love, if love be ours, faith and unfaith can ne'er be equal powers. Faith in aught is want of faith in all. It is the little rift within the lute that by and by will make the music mute and ever widening slowly silence all. 
The little rift within the lover's lute, or little pitted speck in garnered fruit, that rotting inward slowly moulders all. Is it not worth the keeping? Let it go. But shall it? Answer, darling, answer no, and trust me not at all, or all in all. O oh, master, do ye love my tender rhyme? And Merlin looked, and half believed her true, So tender was her voice, so fair her face, So sweetly gleamed her eyes behind her tears, Like sunlight on the plain behind a shower, And yet he answered half indignantly, Far other was the song that once I heard by this huge oak, Sung nearly where we sit, For here we met some ten or twelve of us, to chase a creature that was current then in these wild woods, the heart with golden horns. It was the time when first the question rose about the founding of a table round. It was to be for love of God and men and noble deeds the flower of all the world. And each incited each to noble deeds. And while we waited, one, the youngest of us all, we could not keep him silent. Out he flashed, and into such a song, such fire for fame, such trumpet glowings in it, coming down to such a stern and iron-clashing close, that when he stopped we longed to hurl together, and should have done it. But the beauteous beast, scared by the noise upstarted at our feet, and like a silver shadow slipped away through the dim land. And all day long we rode through the dim land against a rushing wind, that glorious roundel echoing in our ears, and chased the flashes of his golden horns till they vanished by the fairy well that laughs at iron, as our warriors did, where children cast their pins and nails and cry, Laugh, little well! But touch it with a sword, it buzzes fiercely round to the point. And there we lost him. Such a noble song was that. But Vivian, when you sang me that sweet rhyme, I felt as though you knew this cursed charm, proving it to me, that I lay and felt them slowly ebbing, name and fame. And Vivian answered, smiling mournfully, O oh, mine have ebbed away for evermore, and all through following you to this wild wood, because I saw you sad to comfort you. Lo now, what hearts have men? They never mount as high as woman in her selfless mood, and touching fame, howe'er ye scorn my song, take one verse more. The lady speaks it, this. My name, once mine, now thine is closelier mine. For fame, could fame be mine, that fame were thine. And shame, could shame be thine, that shame were mine. So trust me not at all, or all in all. Says she not well, and there is more. This rhyme is like the fair pearl necklace of the queen that burst in dancing, and the pearls were spilt. Some lost, some stolen, some as relics kept. But never more the same two sister pearls ran down the silken thread to kiss each other on her white neck. So is it with this rhyme. It lives dispersedly in many hands, and every minstrel sings it differently. It is their one true line, the pearl of pearls. Man dreams of fame while woman wakes to love. Yea, love, though love were of the grossest, carves a portion from the solid present, eats and uses, careless of the rest. But fame, the fame that follows death, is nothing to us. And what is fame in life but half disfame, and counterchanged with darkness? Ye yourself know well that envy calls you devil's son, and since ye seem the master of all art, they fain would make you master of all vice. And Merlin locked his hand in hers and said, I once was looking for a magic weed, 
and found a fair young squire who sat alone, had carved himself a knightly shield of wood, and then was painting on it fancied arms, azure, an eagle rising, or the sun indexed a chief, the scroll, I follow fame, and speaking not, but leaning over him I took his brush and blotted out the bird, and made a gardener putting in a graph with this for motto, rather use than fame. You should have seen him blush, but afterwards he made a stalwart knight. Oh, Vivian, for you methinks you think you love me well. For me, I love you somewhat. Rest, and love should have some rest and pleasure in himself. Not ever be too curious for a boon, too prurient for a proof against the grain of him ye say ye love. But fame with men, being but ampler means to serve mankind, should have small rest or pleasure in herself, but work as vassal to the larger love, that dwarfs the petty love of one to one. Use gave me fame at first, and fame again increasing gave me use. Lo, there my boon. What other? For men sought to prove me vile, because I fain had given them greater wits, and then did envy call me devil's son, the sick weak beast seeking to help herself by striking at her better mist, and brought her own claw back and wounded her own heart. Sweet were the days when I was all unknown, but when my name was lifted up, the storm brake on the mountain, and I cared not for it. Right well know I that fame is half disfame. It needs must work my work. That other fame, to one at least, who hath not children vague, the cackle of the unborn about the grave, I cared not for it. A single misty star, which is the second in a line of stars that seem a sword beneath a belt of three. I never gazed upon it, but I dreamed of some vast charm, concluded in that star, to make fame nothing. Wherefore, if I fear giving you power upon me through this charm, that you might play me falsely having power, however well ye think ye love me now, as sons of kings loving in pupilage have turned to tyrants when they came to power, I rather dread the loss of use than fame. If you, and not so much from wickedness as some wild turn of anger, or a mood of overstrained affection it may be, to keep me all to your own self, or else a sudden spurt of woman's jealousy should try this charm on whom ye say ye love. And Vivian answered, smiling as in wrath, Have I not sworn? I am not trusted. Good. Well, hide it, hide it, I shall find it out. And being found, take heed of Vivian. A woman and not trusted. Doubtless I might feel some sudden turn of anger born of your misfaith. And your fine epithet is accurate too. For this full love of mine without the full heart back may merit well your term of overstrained. So used as I, my daily wonder is I love at all. And as to woman's jealousy, oh, why not? Oh, to what end except a jealous one, and one to make me jealous if I love? Was this fair charm invented by yourself? I well believe that all about this world ye cage a buxom captive here and there, closed in the four walls of a hollow tower from which is no escape for evermore. Then the great master merrily answered her, Full many a love in loving youth was mine. I needed then no charm to keep them mine but youth and love, and that full heart of yours whereof ye prattle may now assure you mine. So live uncharmed. For those who wrought it first, the wrist is parted from the hand that waved, the feet unmortised from their ankle bones who paced it ages back. But will ye hear the legend as in guerdon for your rhyme? There lived a king in the most eastern east, less old than I, yet older, for my blood hath earnest in it of far springs to be. 
a tawny pirate anchored in his port, whose bark had plundered twenty nameless isles. And passing one at the high peep of dawn, he saw two cities in a thousand boats all fighting for a woman on the sea. And pushing his black craft among them all, he lightly scattered theirs and brought her off, with loss of half his people arrow slain. A maid so smooth, so white, so wonderful, they said a light came from her when she moved. And since the pirate would not yield her up, the king impaled him for his piracy, then made her queen. But those isle-nurtured eyes waged such unwilling, though successful, war on all the youth, they sickened, councils thinned, and armies waned, for magnet-like she drew the rustiest iron of old fighters' hearts, and beasts themselves would worship Camels knelt unbidden, and the brutes of mountain back that carry kings in castles bowed black knees of homage, ringing with their serpent hands to make her smile her golden ankle bells. What wonder, being jealous, that he sent his horns of proclamation out through all the hundred under kingdoms that he swayed, to find a wizard who might teach the king some charm, which being wrought upon the queen might keep her all his own. To such a one he promised more than ever king has given, a league of mountains full of golden mines, a province with a hundred miles of coast, a palace and a princess, all for him, that on all those who tried and failed the king pronounced a dismal sentence, meaning by it to keep the list low and pretenders back, or like a king not to be trifled with, their heads should moulder on the city gates. And many tried and failed, because the charm of nature in her overbore their own. And many a wizard brow bleached on the walls. And many weeks a troop of carrion crows hung like a cloud above the gateway towers. And Vivian, breaking in upon him, said, I sit and gather honey, yet methinks thy tongue has tripped a little. Ask thyself. The lady never made unwilling war with those fine eyes. She had her pleasure in it, and made her good man jealous with good cause. And lived there neither dame nor damsel then, wroth at a lover's loss? Were all as tame, I mean, as noble as the queen was fair? Not one to flirt a venom at her eyes, or pinch a murderous dust into her drink? or make her paler with a poisoned rose. Well, those were not our days. But did they find a wizard? Tell me, was he like to thee? She ceased, and made her lithe arm round his neck tighten, and then drew back, and let her eyes speak for her, glowing on him, like a bride's on her new lord, her own, the first of men. He answered, laughing, Nay, not like to me. At last they found, his foragers for charms, a little glassy-headed hairless man who lived alone in a great wild on grass, read but one book, and ever reading grew so grated down and filed away with thought, so lean his eyes were monstrous, while the skin clung but to crate and basket ribs and spine and since he kept his mind on one sole aim nor ever touched fierce wine nor tasted flesh nor owned a sensual wish to him the wall that sunders ghosts and shadow casting men became a crystal and he saw them through it and heard their voices talk behind the wall and learnt their elemental secrets powers and forces Often o'er the sun's bright eye drew the vast eyelid of an inky cloud, and lashed it at the base with slanting storm. Or in the noon of mist and driving rain, when the lake whitened and the pine wood roared, and the canned mountain was a shadow, sunned the world to peace again. Here was the man, and so by force they dragged him to the king. And then he taught the king to charm the queen in such wise, that no man could see her more, nor saw she save the king, who wrought the charm, coming and going. And she lay as dead, and lost all use of life. 
But when the king made proffer of the League of Golden Mines, the province with a hundred miles of coast, the palace and the princess, that old man went back to his old wild and lived on grass and vanished. And his book came down to me. And Vivian answered, smiling saucily, Ye have the book. The charm is written in it. Good. Take my counsel. Let me know it at once, for keep it like a puzzle chest in chest, with each chest locked and padlocked thirtyfold, and whelm all this beneath as fast a mound as after furious battle turfs the slain on some wild down above the windy deep. I yet should strike upon a sudden means to dig, pick, open, find, and read the charm. Then, if I tried it, who should blame me then? And smiling as a master smiles at one that is not of his school, nor any school but that where blind and naked ignorance delivers brawling judgments, unashamed on all things all day long, he answered her, Thou read the book, my pretty Vivian. Oh, I, it is but twenty pages long, but every page having an ample march, and every march enclosing in the midst a square of text that looks a little blot, the text no larger than the limbs of fleas, and every square of text an awful charm, written in a language that has long gone by, so long that mountains have arisen since with cities on their flanks. Thou read the book and every margin scribbled, crossed and crammed with comment, densest condensation, hard to mind and eye. But the long sleepless nights of my long life have made it easy to me, and none can read the text, not even I, and none can read the comment but myself, and in the comment did I find the charm. Oh, the results are simple. A mere child might use it to the harm of any one, and never could undo it. Ask no more, for though you should not prove it upon me, but keep that oath ye swear, ye might perchance assay it on some one of the table round, but all because ye dream they babble of you. And Vivian, frowning in true anger, said, What dare the full-fed liars say of me? They ride abroad redressing human wrongs. They sit with knife in meat and wine in horn. They bound to holy vows of chastity. Were I not woman, I could tell a tale. But you are man. You well can understand the shame that cannot be explained for shame. Not one of all the droves should touch me, swine. Then answered Merlin, careless of her words, who breathe but accusation vast and vague, spleen-born, I think, and proofless. If ye know, set up the charge ye know to stand or fall. And Vivian answered, frowning wrathfully, O oh, I, what say ye to Sir Valence, him whose kinsman left him watcher or his wife and two fair babes, and went to distant lands, was one year gone, and on returning found not two but three? There lay the wrecking, one but one hour old. What said the happy sire? A seven-month babe had been a truer gift. Those twelve sweet moons confused his fatherhood. Then answered Merlin, Nay, I know the tale. Sir Valence wedded with an outland dame. Some cause had kept him sundered from his wife. One child they had, it lived with her. She died. His kinsman, travelling on his own affair, was charged by Valence to bring home the child. He brought it, not found it, therefore. Take the truth. Oh, ay, said Vivian, over true a tale. What say ye then to sweet Sir Sacramor, that ardent man? To pluck the flower in season, so says the song, I trow it is no treason. O oh, master, shall we call him over quick to crop his own sweet rose before the hour? And Merlin answered, Over quick art thou to catch a loathly plume fallen from the wing of that foul bird of rapine whose whole prey is man's good name. He never wronged his bride. 
I know the tale. An angry gust of wind puffed out his torch among the myriad roomed and many corridored complexities of Arthur's palace. Then he found a door, and Darkling felt the sculptured ornament that wreathen round it made it seem his own, and wearied out made for the couch and slept, a stainless man beside a stainless maid. And either slept, nor knew of other there, till the high dawn piercing the royal rose in Arthur's casement glimmered chastely down, blushing upon them blushing and at once he rose without a word and parted from her. But when the thing was blazed about the court, the brute world, howling, forced them into bonds, and as it chanced they are happy, being pure. Oh, I said Vivian, that were likely too. What say ye then to fair Sir Percivale, and of the horrid foulness that he wrought? The saintly youth, the spotless lamb of Christ, or some black weather of St. Satan's fold. What, in the precincts of the chapel yard, among the nightly brasses of the graves, by the cold hick yackets of the dead? And Merlin answered, careless of her charge, A sober man is Percivale and pure, but once in life was flustered with new wine, then paced for coolness in the chapel yard, where one of Satan's shepherdesses caught and bent to stamp him with her master's mark. And that he sinned is not believable, for look upon his face. But if he sinned, the sin that practice burns into the blood, but not the one dark hour which brings remorse, will brand us after of whose fold we be, or else were he the holy king whose hymns are chanted in the minster worse than all. But is your spleen frothed out, or have ye more? And Vivian answered, frowning yet in wrath, Oh, I would say you to Sir Lancelot, friend, traitor or true, that commerce with the queen. I ask you, is it clamoured by the child, or whispered in the corner, do ye know? To which he answered sadly, Yea, I know it. Sir Lancelot went ambassador at first to fetch her and she watched him from her walls. The rumour runs she took him for the king, so fixed her fancy on him. Let them be. But have ye no one word of loyal praise for Arthur, blameless king and stainless man, 